seven, six, five, four, three, two, one. Welcome to SIUS 2023. My name is Julia Tollin and I have the great honor of being the stage host of this fantastic seminar. And to kick this uh, seminar, to kick it out, to what's the word? Kick it on, <laughs> that's the word, it got stuck in my head. I need help from the project manager, project manager. so give it up for Elin Palm. <laughs> Yes, here we have her. So today we're going to witness um, young scientists sharing their research and work from this stage. Uh, but who are they actually? So uh, here we have at Science, we have 18 participants presenting their science. In this session we have five, I believe. Um, and they come from 14 different countries all across the globe and they are in the age of uh, 18 to 25. Some are here because they're doing really amazing research at their universities, while others are here because of research they've been conducting during their high school years. Really smart people. Really smart people. <laughs> yeah, so if, y if you're sitting in the audience right now and you would like to be a person standing on a stage like this presenting your work, where do you start? I would say that for most of you in the audience or perhaps those listening in online as well, you start by creating a really amazing scientific high school diploma project. If you do that and you participate with your project in Utställningen that Unge Forsker is organizing, the exhibition, you might be one uh, of the great and lucky winners to become part of the Swedish national team in science. Um, and then you get to compete with your project in international science competition and science fairs, like the European competitions for young scientists or the international science and engineering fair. And if you're performing well and are uh, lucky and uh, so in these uh, competitions, you might uh, win the science prize. So many of our participants here won their spots here through these fairs. Another way to go is to conduct uh, science at the one of our uh, partner universities or uh, associated organizations, and then they might select you and your research to be sent to SIES. Okay, thank you. And the organizers of this uh, seminar day is the Federation of Young Scientists. Uh, tell us about the organization. Uh, the Organization of Young Scientists uh, is a um, youth organization that aims to make science as a natural hobby as other common hobbies we see in youth, like, I don't know, gaming or Netflix or football or whatever it is you do in your spare time. Uh, we want science and uh, science engagement to be as natural as hobby. Um, and we do this by uh, the, our partner organizations or um, member organizations are uh, organizations, science organizations at universities or high schools. And then we have the exhibition, Utställningen, uh, where we showcase high school science and high school scientists could be you. Uh, and we also have uh, SIAS trying to promote science to youth. Um, so there are many things that the Federation does to engage youth in science. Cool. And if you're Swedish here, you can go to ungaforskare.se, right? Yeah, you can visit our webpage. You can also come up and talk to us if you uh, have questions on how to how to become a science participant uh, through uh, Utställning and so on. We are really good at answering questions about the things we are doing in the Federation. Thank you. Give it up for Elin. In this session, we also have my wonderful sidekick. Give a warm hand to Arman. You are joining us on stage and you will stay here throughout the presentations and everything to gather up the questions, right? Exactly. Well, hopefully not right here, but I'm sitting there and I'm looking at the mentee and I'm basically just going to pick some questions that I'm going to ask to the participants. Uh, as an aside, I also went to Kungsholmen Gymnasium. Cool to see you guys. And I hope to see more of you at uh, Kotiho. 
Ah, amazing. <laughs> Give it up for our man. As Elin said, we have five presentations in this session. And the first one is going to join us on stage now. This, um, in this project, she experimentally investigates the thermal and medical behavior of cometary nucleons surface on the Planetary ISIS Laboratory of Lulio University of Technology. She is from Portugal. Give it up for Mariana Rice. <laughs> Hello. Are we ready? <laughs> How do comets work? This is the research question I'm working in Lulio University of Technology, where I'm doing my PhD in Kiruna campus, which is the space campus. So let's start with the classic, classic definition of comets. So, comet consists of a solid nucleus, comet, and tails, where here we have the west comet, where we can clearly see the two different tails, the iron tail in blue and the dust tail in white, gray. The nucleus is an ice-rich porous body that consists of a mix of volatiles and refractory materials. When they are close to the sun, they show detectable mass loss, um, where we can clearly see here, the tails are effectively them losing mass. Uh, they are form, oh, they appear fuzzy, and it's their comma and their tails that make them appear fuzzy to us. And they are formed from the our solar system, and they are thought to contain the most primitive material from the formation of the solar system. However, we still do not know how they work. Uh, so, I want to know what is actually happening underneath the surface of what is effectively a dirty snowball. So, uh, in order to do so, I work in the Planetary ISIS lab in Kiruna campus, where we can make cometary analogs in lab with water snow, and we make water snow, this is the first picture, is the water snow production. So, we basically spray water into a dewer with liquid nitrogen, and we get small spherical water droplets, water snow, that we can use as the cometary analog material. On the middle, we have our vacuum chamber to replicate space conditions, and we have our solar simulator to replicate space conditions. So basically, this equipment is used to investigate comets' thermal physical processes and replicate their environmental conditions. We can also make CO2 snow. CO2 has also been found in comets, and we can produce that in lab. So we connect the snowpack to a, a tank with CO2, fill it up, and we get a block of CO2 snow. To get it back into fluffy snow, we dump it into a dewer with liquid nitrogen, and it separates into spherical particles. Uh, we need to be really fast with CO2 snow because it starts evaporating almost immediately. So we use our cooling setup plates to keep it cool so we can see. And here is an example of a picture we, where we have, we could see small spherical uh, snow particles separated. And this is what a fresh CO2 snow looks like. Um, what is a typical experimental comet simulation looks like? This is it. So we have a dirty vacuum chamber with the sample inside being irradiated from the top with our solar simulator and being cooled with liquid nitrogen because space is cold. So um, we can do some measurements inside the chamber, take some pictures, and then we do some analysis uh, outside of the chamber also. So let's now go over observations. So here we have the before and after of solar irradiation on a cometary analog material. In my case, the cometary analog material is water, ice, and carbon black. Yes, it's very simple, but we need to start with simple materials, fully understand it, and then develop on that. Um, so as the solar radiation penetrates uh, the ice, uh, it is absorbed by the black particles, by the carbon black, and the water is sublimated. And as it's sublimated, we see that we are left behind with um, 
residue, carbon residue, in the form of a fluffy crust. Uh, the difference between these these pictures uh, is the carbon black percentage. There's less in the top one and more in the bottom one, so we have a more cr a bigger fluffy crust or more of a fluffy crust than on the top. That's basically the difference. Um, and this carbon black uh, crust is a great thermal insulator and absorbs almost all sunlight. So we, wait, sorry, <laughs> we observe uh, sublimation of the volatiles and um, a formation of a dust mantle and a hardening of the ice. Initially, the sample is very fluffy, but um, after insulation, there's water sublimation, formation of the dust castle, and the ice is hardened. So there's some resistance to the ice also. So now, what is actually my research topic? I want to understand whether the crust formation makes the comet lose mass quicker or slower. Because if there's too much carbon, it will block the light from penetrating deep into the ice and almost nothing will happen. But if there's too little carbon, then it makes the ice sublimate too fast, which we also don't want. Because comets can orbit uh, the sun multiple times without losing their mass or disappearing on the first orbit. So I want to know how does carbon content influences ice metamorphism? And there are some results that show that there's this optical percentage for carbon, carbon percentage that makes the energy transfer into the ice more efficient. I want to actually quantify this energy transfer and explain the processes going on in the ice in the cometary nucleus analog experimentally through my experiments. And hopefully, my results will help understand how solar energy is transferred into a nucleus and how a comet evolves over time. These are some of the references I've used. Feel free to check on them. Thank you so much. Thank you, Mariana. We have Armand joining with questions. Yes, so we got a few questions. Uh, one was, what inspired you to research about comets? Um, I, I like to walk around in astronomy fields. I've done um, instrumental, I've done exoplanets, and I had the opportunity to do comets, and I was like, let's go for it. Yeah. Awesome. Uh, what kind of findings are you hoping for? Um, I'm hoping to fully understand the processes happening with energy transferred into the ice, like fully understand it and then grow on that and add more contaminants and make something more realistic in the end of my PhD. Do you think your results might lend credence to the theory that life may have come from a comet? Yeah, hopefully. <laughs> yes, absolutely. Yeah, that would be great. Thank you. Hello. Big applause for Mariana, amazing. Oh no, don't take that. <laughs> we'll create a problem for the next one. Fluffy crust. That's a word I'm going to remember. Okay, it's time for the second presentation. Uh, this is about, uh, he developed bandages that can act like chemical reactors to rapidly resolve antibiotic resistant infections. From USA, give it up for Daniel Levine. All right, so hi everybody. Um, today I'm really excited to present my research addressing antimicrobial resistant infections, which are expected to kill more people than cancer within just 30 years. And one of these microbes is the bacterial pathogen Staphylococcus aureus, or Staph. One way that Staph infects people is by colonizing wounds on the skin and grouping together with other Staph bacteria to form a biofilm structure that can stop the healing process and can also be impenetrable to antibiotics, 
which remain the standard of care for this type of infection. So to address this need for novel interventions in my project, I created bandages that use low-level electric signals to rapidly resolve these bacteria. And I did this by first making the bandages out of a microbial-based material called bacterial cellulose. And we're looking at this polymer here. And it's made by a beneficial bacteria to protect itself from the surrounding environment. But what I like the bacterial cellulose for is that it has a unique combination of both strength, flexibility, and water retention that make it a really great material for healing wounds. But on its own, this cellulose has no antimicrobial properties. So to endow it with this capability, I loaded it with small dark compounds called carbon nanotubes, or CNTs. And these CNTs are one of the most electrically conductive materials at room temperature. But one issue with using CNTs is that they're hydrophobic. So they tend to clump together when in aqueous solutions. So to address this, I used a molecule called a surfactant. It has a hydrophilic head and a hydrophobic tail. And how it works is the hydrophobic tail interacts with the CNTs and the hydrophilic head interacts with the surrounding solution and essentially coats the CNTs and pulls them apart from one another, just like how you use soap to get dirt off your hands. And so once I made a dispensed CNT solution, it was really easy for me to load these nanotubes into the bandage material. And once I made the material, I wanted to see how stable it was. And so I did this by running experiments to assess the amount of nanotubes that are leaked out of the bandage over time. And we can see those results here. So after a 48-hour time period, there is a, almost 100% retention of the initial CNTs that were loaded into the bandage. And once I knew that the CNTs were really, really stable in the bandage, I want to see probably why that occurred. So I looked at these bandages under a microscope at really, really high magnifications, 50,000 times. And what we can see here is individual cellulose threads that were produced by that beneficial microbe. And these knit together with each other to form that polymer structure. And when loaded with carbon nanotubes, each of the fibers swell. And that swelling results in a reduction in pore size across the surface of the membrane, which suggests substantial CNT deposition. But when I looked at those pores in the inside of the bacteria, or the bacterial cellulose in the cross section, we can see these large cavities that are not filled in when the nanotubes are loaded, which suggests that there's an open cavity. And I used that cavity to infuse the bacterial cellulose with antibiotic solutions and also electrolyte. And so after I made the bandage and I determined that it was stable, I then designed circuitry throughout the bandage to deliver stable currents. And I did this by threading copper wire through one end as a working electrode, which collects current levels, and titanium wire in a semicircle as the counter electrode. And this controls the power output of the potentiostat. And that's the machine I use to generate electricity. So what we're seeing on the bottom here is an overall experimental setup. The black part on the top is the BCCNT bandage. Below that in green is the staph bacteria. And below that in orange is this agar disc that's acting as a wound model. Surrounding the whole thing is an insulatory polymer, and I also loaded the bandage with an electrolyte sodium chloride. And so to test it, I set a potential of either 0 volts as a control group or 2.5 or 5 volts as experimental groups. I then separated the two components of the electrochemical system and let biofilms form on top of them for 24 hours. And we're looking at those pictures here. So on the side, we can see 0 volts as a control or 2.5 or 5 volts as experimental groups, and on the top, we can see different sample types. So the vancomycin notation, that is an antibiotic that's used to treat serious staph infection with increasing concentration, and also sample type. So phenol red is a pH indicator, and this orange color is showing a pH of around 7, and then UFTYE, that's our wound model, and BCCNT, that's our bandage. And the glowing green stuff atop these discs is biofilms of staph. So what we can see is that initially, with no electricity, the staff are really, really good at forming these very, very large biofilms. And they're even able to form that in the presence of antibiotics, which is showing their resistance. But we can see a small area around the copper working electrode, which suggests that the copper itself, without electricity, has antimicrobial capabilities. And then when I set an electric potential, 
we can see an expanded area of inhibited growth around that working electrode, and that area of blocked bioform formation greatly expands when I added antibiotic concentrations that staph is initially resistant to, which suggests increased septability. And we also see a reduction in pH around that working electrode. And so I wanted to look at what was happening to these microbes, not only at the very large biofilm scale, but also in a really, really small scale. And so what we can see is that there's substantial damage to the membrane of the bacteria. They're mass producing these really small particles, which address extreme cellular stress. And to better understand why that occurred, I made some electrical models, which suggest that the bandage provides enough energy to facilitate chemical reactions that generate species that are harmful for these microbes, and also sort of moves the ions around in the solution that disrupt the bacterial homeostasis. So overall, what I want you guys to know from this project is that you should look to nature when you're designing solutions to today's problems. I used ingenious creations from beneficial bacteria to develop bandages that can address infections caused by harmful ones. Um, so thanks so much for listening, and I'm happy to take any questions. Really inspiring. Thank you. Yes, so we got some questions in. Uh, one that came up a few times was, what inspired you to use carbon nanotubes in this bandage? Yeah, that's a great question. So carbon nanotubes have really, really, really impressive electrical conductivity at room temperature. And they're also relatively non-toxic compared to other nanoparticles that are also conductive. Awesome. What was the biggest challenge in your research? The biggest challenge was continuing to work on this project when it wasn't working out initially. So a lot of times in engineering, when you start out with a prototype, it's not going to work. And you just keep have to working on it and tinkering with it, reading current literature and changing your approach so that you get some differences in your results. And hopefully that's favorable to the overall goal that you're working on. But that was the biggest challenge. Very interesting. Thank you very much. Yep. Give it up for Daniel. This next research, research explore the onset of swirl in elliptical liquid jets. From Switzerland, give a warm round of applause for Jan Kam. Do another one. So, hello everyone. As already mentioned, my name is Jan Kamm. I'm from Zurich, which is in Switzerland. And welcome to my project, project called Water Spiral, a study on circular, elliptical and swirling jet flows. So, as one might already tell from the title, it, is, uh, it falls under the branch of fluid dynamics in physics. And essentially, it revolves around the behavior of different liquid jets. So why am I here? And I think this part might be actually pretty interesting to you guys because as high school students you might relate and um, it might be inspiring or influence your scientific path for the future. So essentially, I've always had a very profound fascination for the complexity of fluid dynamics and also other branches in physics. When I was about 16 years old, my physics teacher picked up on my interest and introduced me to the International Young Physicist Tournament. Maybe some of you have heard of it. Essentially, it's uh, the biggest team-based high school physics competition that involves um, research-based open-ended questions in contrast to, for example, if you know that the Physics Olympiad, where it's more like exam-based exam exercise solving. So there I participated twice, and fortunately um, I won the national competition twice, as well as the international ones, and there won uh, I picked a fluid dynamics problem called water spiral, which essentially is where my research stems from. So uh, after that, I worked on it for another year or so, and then I handed it in to Swiss Youth in Science, which is my sending organization. And there I won two special prizes, and one of them being the reason why I'm standing here in front of you today, the Stockholm International Youth Science Seminar. So now let's move on to the interesting stuff, the physics. So I looked at three different types of jets, essentially where um, we have the circular jet on the, on the left, the elliptical jet in the middle, and to the right we have the 
swirling jet. So um, essentially, the undocumented phenomenon of such swirling jets are with such an elliptical cross-section are not discussed in literature and therefore um, both investigated both experimentally and theoretically as the main novelty of my work. And visually, there are mainly two characteristics that di distinguish the different jets from each other. So um, we have, the first of all, the shape of the jet, which is called the free surface, as well as um, for the elliptical and the swirling jet, we have uh, such wavelengths, which are also quite relevant. So essentially, everyone certainly knows, so let's, let's start at the most basic case. So everyone certainly knows when opening the tap, such as um, circular fluid jet is ejected, which just gets th thinner and thinner along the jet axis. And then by further changing the outlet to an elliptical shape, we then uh, achieve this elliptical jet, um, which exhibits this chain-like shape, which is basically due to a competition between inertia and surface tension. And afterwards, by further imposing swirl on our base flow, we end up with the swirling jet. So as one usually does in fluid dynamics, uh, maybe you've seen those equations. Um, one starts with a set of equations, which are called the Navier-Stokes equations and the mass continuity equation, but I won't go into detail here. But Essentially, it's like Newton's second law of motion, but for fluids, where we have like the term on the left-hand side resembling mass times acceleration, and on the right-hand side, the uh, sum of forces. Then we have mass continuity, which says mass is conserved, so um, mass cannot just be created out of thin air or just vanish, and what flows in essentially flows out again. And then afterwards, tedious calculations later, we end up with models for the different jet characteristics, um, which allow us, to or allow us to describe the different characteristics based on the parameters. So essentially, um, I developed, first of all, on the experimental side, such a pump circuit, which is, I would say, rather simple. We have um, uh, such a membrane pump, which sucks the fluid out of the bucket in an oscillatory manner. It then the, the fluid goes through um, uh, the, such a pulsation dampener, which achieves continuous flow, and then it exits through the nozzle or the, or the hose outlet back into the bucket, and it repeats. Now, um, my research involved many experimental challenges. On the one hand, since those swirling jets were um, not documented, I had to come up with my own system to sort of reproduce them for accurate experimentation, which, in, in my case, I developed this nozzle system. And another main challenge was to keep the jets very laminar, which means that, in a way, the, the fluid is, behaves well. I, I'm, if you know what it is, it's, in a way, opposed to turbulent flow, but... <laughs> Um, but essentially, we had to get all those dimensions right, which was quite a challenge. Um, and this involved dozens of nozzles, which had to be printed uh, over a period of months. And it was quite exhausting, but we managed in the end somehow. And essentially, this nozzle system works the following way. We have a chamber that initially makes the flow turbulent again, neutralizes all initial disturbances. And we have such a out jet outflow channel, which laminarizes the flow again and then we apply or impose the swirl on our flow. So in my work, I had several um, novel results, mainly on the theoretical side, the derivations of those models, where for the swirling jet, I developed new models, essentially. And on the experimental side, the 3D printing of those nozzles. And the comparison between the experiments and the th theory allowed me, essentially, to find conditions under which the a jet will twist into a spiral. So I further could do parameter variation, which allowed me to assess limits and, as I mentioned, um, to ch essentially check how the jet behaves. Um, due to time constraints, of, I cannot show you um, all of my results, but here's just one example where um, I looked at the wavelengths of the different jets, where the yellow points re re resemble the elliptical jets, and the blue ones are different data sets of um, swirling ones, and we see that the wavelength in general is smaller for the swirling ones, but how much smaller exactly is then, of course, modeled in my work, and feel free to read it um, if you come by my stand. Thank you very much. Um, I'm, I'm ready for the questions. Hi. So one question I got was, 
Do you have any advice for aspiring young scientists, and particularly for those who compete in physics? Um, yes, so what I did essentially, in a way I killed two birds with one stone, so I ha this also was my high school project, but then I, I used this as well for the International Young Physicist Tournament, I used this as well for a big lab report in physics I had to do, afterwards for Swiss Youth in Science, so instead of having many small projects, I essentially had one big one on which I decided on early and then um, in a way pooled all th that effort. Yes. I know that in your paper and as well on the poster, you named some applications of this research. Could you go into one or two of them, maybe? Well, since it is undocumented, so far there are no real applications, but I've talked to um, some people from some firms in Switzerland where um, they told me that it might have applications, for example, in mixing, where they already use the elliptical jets because they have like this lateral motion which enhances um, the mixing, and the swirling jet would be even better there, for example. That's really cool. Thanks. Thank you very much. Big round of applause for Jan Kam. The next research investigates the effect of different chemical modifications on the selectivity of eco-friendly filtration membranes. From Singapore, Limen Shan. All right, good morning, everyone. Okay, so my name's Lehman. I'm 18 this year, and I'm from Singapore. And today, I'll be sharing a little bit more about my project. I started this project two years ago, and I think it's really taught me a lot about the process of doing science. First of all, I know that's a long title, okay? But you really only need to focus on one key phrase, filtration membranes. My project is all about water filtration. You know, nowadays, water pollution is a big issue, and we wanted to see how we could contribute to sustainability research. I've always loved doing chemistry, especially in the lab, and so using it in the fight against one of our generation's most pressing issues made the project very meaningful to me. This all started when my friends and I found this very interesting research paper where they created filtration membranes from essentially two materials. One, polyethylene terephthalate, or PET. This is the really tough kind of plastic you see in plastic bottles, and it's non-biodegradable, right? It won't break down naturally. In the original paper, they actually recycled old plastic bottles to make the filter membranes, which helps to promote sustainability. Two is chitosan. Chitosan is a biopolymer, and it's really the key to our project because this biopolymer can be modified with different chemical groups. So here comes the question. If I were to add different chemical groups onto the chitosan with different polarities, how would that affect the kind of pollutants that it prefers to remove? We know from the adage, like dissolves like, that substances with similar polarities will have greater affinity for each other. If you've done this thing called thin layer chromatography, you know that the polarity of a surface heavily affects what kind of substances are attracted to it. So, we hypothesize filters with a more polar modification would tend to remove more polar pollutants and vice versa. Right, let's talk about our active material, chitosan. Chitosan is derived from crustacean shell waste, of which there's a lot. This is the chemical structure of chitosan. It's a polymer, so there are many repeating units in this chain. There are a lot of alcohol and amine groups which help to facilitate polar interactions, but most importantly are the amine groups. These groups allow us to attach other chemical modifications onto the chitosan backbone. We use four different types of modifications, as well as pure chitosan, so unmodified, as a control. And this gives us five varieties. Of these five varieties, we expect propionyl, isobutyryl, and benzoyl-modified chitosan to be less polar, while succinyl and pure chitosan would be more polar. Next, what are we actually using as the pollutants? 
to model the pollutants, we use three different dyes, Congo red, malachite green, and methylene blue in order of decreasing polarity. We also use this technique called ultraviolet visible light spectroscopy. This measures the amount of light absorbed by the sample. By comparing the before and after, we can then see how much percentage of dye was removed by our filter. Okay, now that we've covered the experimental plan, let's move on to the methodology. So we start off PET bottles, Kaitosan. To the PET bottles, we must first dissolve and purify them in order to remove any impurities that might be inside the plastic bottle. And you get these white plastic circles. Then you cut them up, the squares of equal area, four centimeters squared. And this is what we'll be using to make our final filter membranes. To the Kaitosan, we first modify them with each of the four different groups that we're using. Then dissolve them in acid to form a solution of Kaitosan, which you just need to coat onto the PET squares and we have our completed filter membranes. We take these completed filter membranes, immerse them in dye solution for a while to absorb as much pollutant as possible. Then after that, we use ultraviolet visible light spectroscopy to compare the concentration before and after. Now, in the end, we found that first of all, succinyl and benzol modified chitosan filters were highly inconsistent. This is likely because of very poor coating onto the PET membrane, so the chitosan didn't stick. However, for the remaining three varieties, we found that it did indeed support our hypothesis. If you look at the more polar dyes, Congo red and malachite green, you see a downward trend. What does this mean? Very polar, pure chitosan is better at removing it than less polar, isobutyral chitosan. And the inverse, for the less polar, methylene blue, the less polar isobutyral modified chitosan is better at removing it than the very polar pure chitosan. This essentially presents an exciting opportunity to tune the selectivity of our filters to target certain pollutants. You might ask, how does this help, right? Well, each filter, you can think of it as having a certain limit to the amount of molecules it can filter out. If your target pollutant takes up a bigger proportion of these molecules, then you have a more effective filter. This synthesis also uses bio-derived chitosan, recycled plastic bottles, and solvents which are less harmful to the environment. And this represents a push towards green chemistry, which is a new and exciting way of doing chemistry, which keeps mother nature in mind. All in all, I think this project really taught me a lot of things, but most important is that sometimes when you're doing science, because of time or budget or experimental constraints, you may have to redo certain steps and change your course a little bit. But we should cherish these moments because it's precisely during these moments that you learn the most and you get the problem solved. And it's what really made me enjoy doing this piece of research. I couldn't fit everything into this seven minute presentation. So please approach me at my booth later if you have any further questions. Otherwise, thank you so much for being a good audience. And I look forward to your questions. Yes, so there's a lot of questions and not a lot of time, but one question I got was, how do you handle waste disposal when it's actually attached to this filter? Oh, so how you handle waste dis Okay, so of course, if you install this filter, it'll remove uh, the pollutants inside your water stream, and then you'll have these pollutants stuck to the filter, right? So one of our experiments, we actually tried this with the dye, and you can see the filter was red afterwards. One potential way you could uh, handle this problem is that you can actually redissolve the PET, of course, separate out the PET and use it to form a new filter or recycle it in some form. Meanwhile, the chitosan and the pollutant will have to be disposed separately. Great. And uh, why? Yes. Why squares for the PET? Oh, squares are easy to cut. <laughs> that makes sense. Uh, another question I got a couple times was. How do you keep motivated through the trials and tribulations of research? Hmm. Uh, I think this is one of the parts of doing this research project that I enjoyed, is that I did it in a team. You know, if you were to do it yourself, you might not see how to get past an obstacle or how to move forward. But in a team, you have different perspectives. You have people who come from different backgrounds. And not only do they help you chart a new course and come up with new ideas, 
they also, we also have to encourage each other when we face certain obstacles. Well spoken. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you, Lee Man. The next young scientist developed a novel optical device and approach that allows patients to determine the parameters of corrective glasses themselves. From the USA, Alexander Plekanov. Thank you. All right, hello everyone. I'm Alex Plekhanov, and my project is on a skew axis cylinder lens optical system and its application in a novel method of clinical optometry of astigmatism, as well as its characterization, theoretical modeling, and implementation. So if you've ever been to an optometrist or an eye doctor, you've probably seen this device in the lower left corner over there. It's called a ferropter. And you've probably gone through the procedure of which is better, number one or number two, where they swap lenses in front of your eyes until you get your right prescription. And as you may know, this is very tedious, it's complicated, it's annoying, it's not a good experience. But what if instead we could move around a computer mouse and find our point of best vision ourselves? Now, this is exactly what my research is on. And in fact, the principle that enables this is actually one that likely many of you are quite familiar with. And in particular, this is the principle of focusing binoculars. So when you focus binoculars, you can actually get a reading of your spherical refractive vision defect. And what this means is that you can get your uh, nearsightedness or your farsightedness prescription. But this then raises the question of why do we even need optometrists? What's the point if we can just replace them with binoculars? And it turns out we can't exactly do that because there exist more complicated defects like astigmatism, which actually affect 30% of the world population. So it's pretty important. Now, what makes it more difficult? And what does this is the fact that it's characterized by not one parameter, as in the case of nearsightedness and farsightedness, but two parameters. These two parameters are optical power and angle of orientation versus how in nearsightedness and farsightedness, it's just optical power. So let's try to come up with a solution for this. Now, the approach I make use of is an optical system of two cylindrical lenses. And so we know that with spherical lenses, we can just add them together. It's very simple. If we have one lens that's one diopter, another that's two diopters, we get three diopters. Easy addition. With cylindrical lenses, it's a bit more difficult. And I won't bore you with the details right now, but essentially what we can do is we can take two cylindrical lenses and rotate them relative to each other. And in this way, we get a composite lens. So we are able to make any arbitrary cylindrical lens within a certain range and obtain any optical power at any orientation. So quickly summarizing my method, I use my apparatus, which relies on this principle of rotation to conduct my experiments. And I used MTF, which stands for modulation transfer function, as a metric of image sharpness. That's all you have to worry about. It's just image sharpness. And so the goal here in my approach was to develop a device that would emphasize the patient's intuitive motion vision response, allowing a patient to directly locate their point of best vision themselves. So what happens is it goes from mouse XY coordinates, because a patient would use a simple 2D input device, like a computer mouse, into coordinates of the angle of orientation of these two cylindrical lenses into coordinates of the combined optical power and angle of orientation that is resulting of this system. So let's take a look at some of the results of this approach. So here we see test targets under different distorting conditions. And what you can actually see is that compensation with my device, the SACLOS, practically fully recovered the sharpness with no residual distortion. But there's still a slight problem. This test target, surprisingly, doesn't make the intuitive apparatus that intuitive. And so let's try to figure out why this is. Now, if we look at its profile and perform some theoretical calculations, we can actually see this problem. And the problem here, going back to the previous slide, is that when we have defocusing on one angle, we actually have it focused in a different angle. And this results, unfortunately, in some confusion. And in fact, this test target, known as the Siemens star, 
is not the only one that suffers from this. In fact, even the common Snellen chart, which you've all probably seen before, has the same problem. If you have vertical focus, uh, if you have horizontal defocus, then you'll have vertical focus and vice versa. Now, what's a simple and easy solution to this? Well, it's just a point light source. With a point light source, the goal is simple. You just try to shrink it into a dot of the smallest possible size. And so now let's see what this point light source test target in conjunction with the SACLOS actually enables. Now, here we see the MTF50, remember that's the sharpness, of the SACLOS as a function of its lens angles. This is without any defect introduced. And now let's introduce a simulated astigmatic defect. And we can see that it actually collapses into a point. And this point is very important because it corresponds to the condition of best vision. And this is what allows us to get a single uh, prescription for the patient very quickly. And here in the bottom two graphs, you can actually see that the measurements are correct and the variability is quite small. So this is very precise and accurate, and in fact, even more so, much more so than the current industry standard. So what is the impact of all of this? Well, overall, the SACLOS approach is expected to greatly improve optometry, in particular the optometry of astigmatism, by making it less time consuming, more accurate, and much cheaper. And in fact, I imagine that perhaps we don't even need optometrists present all the time to obtain prescriptions. And we could have this device just stand as a kiosk in some pharmacy, and you could come up and get your prescription in minutes. And that's how powerful this is. Now, one thing I'd like to emphasize is that I actually did this with just a high school background, similar to all of you. And there inherently is nothing more complicated in here than what you all are taught in high school. Just a bit of additional research, and you could have come up with this yourself. So what I'm trying to say with this is that as you embark on your journeys, I'd like you to remember that innovation starts with a single idea that someone then has the courage to pursue. And so all of you have the potential to be catalysts for change, to shape the future, and to really make a difference. And so I challenge you to be curious, be bold, and to never underestimate the impact that you can have on the world. Thank you. Thank you. That was a really good talk. Yeah. So there's a lot of questions and, again, not a lot of time, but uh, so how old were you when you started doing this research and how did the idea come to you to begin with? Yeah, so I was around 16 years old. I'm 18 now. And the idea came to me because stigmatism runs in my family and, in fact, my parents were actually complaining about how uh, this procedure is so complicated when the, you go to an optometrist. And I thought there's no way it actually has to be this way especially because I knew the stuff about how focusing binoculars could um, give you your spherical refractive vision defect. And so I started investigating this, and this is the idea I eventually came up with and pursued. How did the idea of using two cylindrical lenses come up? Okay, so we know that we can add spherical lenses, as I've said before. Now, it's very simple, it's scalar addition. With cylindrical lenses, we have a magnitude and an orientation. If you're familiar with vector addition, you probably see where I'm going here. Now, we can model this as a vector, or essentially an arrow with a length and a direction. And so now, if we add these two arrows, and we have this fixed magnitude, but we vary their relative angles, we can actually get any arrow or any lens as a result of this. And so the process is essentially just an extrapolation of the spherical addition we are taught in physics in high school. Awesome. What were some challenges you encountered while designing this novel method of optometry? Oh, there were a lot. Uh -huh. <laughs> so just manufacturing the device, for example, was very difficult. There was a lot of imprecision that I had to overcome. Um, oftentimes, my equipment would fail me. I have 3D printed this just at home in my garage, and so sometimes my 3D printer would just straight up spit out garbage. And <laughs> it was, there were many, many challenges along the route here but you persevered. Thank you That's so much. Right. Thank you. Give it up for Alexander. There you go.
Okay, so we have witnessed five presentations on these sessions. You have seen some of the most brilliant young minds in the world sharing their science and research. And I loved the way Alexander finished his presentation saying, be curious, be bold, and don't under underestimate the impact you can have on the world. So you uh, make sure that you, um, you who are here on physically in the audience, make sure that you speak to the uh, to the young scientist on the on the exhibition. And if you are joining live on the live stream, you can take part of the presentations online later. So thank you for this seminar. Bye.